Soxy, Soxy. <gasps> Good morning, Tam Tam. How's it going in the land of lockdown? Mm, well, the land of lockdown. Yes, the lo- the lockdown is officially here. Um, yeah. So. That means no nail salons, no hair salons, no You're gems. Like, that's what you said is the yes. worst thing. You're like, no nails, no <laughs> hair. I'm like, there's a lot worse, like schools. And like, I mean, so school. Well, no, I feel like I've now, unfortunately, gotten used to this homeschool thing. I'm like, okay, it's homeschool. But if you see a cave woman sitting across from you next week, <laughs> you know why. I've officially given up now. Oh, I've, I've given, given up, up too. <laughs> I've given up too. Like, my underarms have got so much hair on them. Oh. And I just don't even care. I'm just like, who cares? Who's he going to have sex with? Like, he has no other option. He's stuck with me. So there is like the hair is growing in all different directions. And I'm well, fine he, with it. He does have another option. He has his right hand. I mean, come <laughs> oh my God. Roxy. <laughs> He's not allowed I mean... to do that, Roxy. I am, but he can't. It's such a double standard. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I would be so mad if he did. I'd be like, what do you mean? No, you, you have wouldn't. the real deal. Oh my God. Yes. You I'd be wouldn't? so mad. Yes. I'm a terrible person. <laughs> You're like, no pleasure unless I'm there. No pleasure for you, only pain. Um, Well, talking about pleasure, because this woman has given me so much pleasure. Not the sexual kind, yes, but in other ways. Maybe. Um, Maybe, maybe. So we're talking today to Catherine Ryan, who is a comedian, a writer, a producer, a creator, a actress, a podcaster, a trailblazer. Oh my God, there's so so many hyphenates. She's the next best thing in the comedy world. And I remember in the height of this pandemic, feeling like there was no hope left and mm-hmm. gravitating towards comedy specials because like it was the only thing that was like making me feel alive and, 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 and better about the situation. Comedy specials like Middleton and Schwartz, Quarter Life Crisis, Ali mm. Wong. And I came across Catherine Ryan's In Trouble. And I must say it was the funniest hour of stand-up comedy I'd ever heard to the point where I DM'd her. It was <laughs> just like, fuck it. You know, like when you just like have like- You're gonna slide you're right such in. such a fan uh-huh. and I was like, I don't even care if you're like, who is this? Mm-hmm. like, I'm going <laughs> to DM her. And then she actually DM'd me back and the whole time I was like on cloud now, my husband's like, who just messaged you? And I'm like, yeah, Um, So welcome. I just want to say your <gasps> oh. special was funny, smart, provocative, and and- everything else so welcome to the show welcome welcome Catherine. you know what else is so good about her is she's so seemingly unapologetically herself like yes you can ask her anything you can talk to her about anything and if she doesn't want to answer or say you know give a give a reason she's gonna say no she'll say fuck off is that right is that right yes is that right i mean there's nothing really that i don't want to talk about i don't understand i think that um maybe it goes hand in hand with being a lady that we're supposed to be um, just discreet mm-hmm. and apologetic. I can't even believe that we say she's unapologetically herself. Like right. what, what do yeah. you, are men unapologetically themselves? I mean, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I just, I live like my life with the confidence of an elderly man. I've always said. Mm. <laughs> it's true. What are elderly men like? <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't really know. <laughs> elderly men are terrible. A lot of them are cute, but many of them have committed yeah. crimes <laughs> and they are proud of themselves and they'll just sit back like weeing in an old armchair and they yeah. don't care what they say. They don't, they're, they're just very confident. Yeah. yeah. And based on nothing. Um, <laughs> uh, they don't know their children, a lot of them. You know, it's a different time. <laughs> yeah. Who are you? My yeah. husband always says, like, because he's 11 years older than me, he always said to me, like, I'm not going to change. He's like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm 47 years old. He's like, there is no, this is it. I'm trying to, like, change my bad habits. He's like, you're fucked. Like, this is all you got. And I'm like, oh, I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to. You know. And now that's not to say that there aren't older people. Like, I think a lot of hmm. times we uh, give them a free pass and we go, well, that's just a crazy old lady. But then someone like Danny DeVito, he's in his seventies and he marches in the gay pride parades and he's very progressive. So mm-hmm. I don't think that's an excuse. It's just, <laughs> I'll let him know. I know. Also one, also one of the kindest people I have to say, he is like top notch. Yeah. He just, you know, just top notch, just a nice guy. Um, so, oh my God, we have so much to talk to you about. There's so many things I want to ask you. Um, um, so you've been doing the comedy. Has it been almost tw- fifteen years now? I How long think has it been? so. Fifteen I mean, I years, think, right? Yeah, a lot of people hit the ground running and they go, "This was my first gig," and then I gigged every. I think it's um, a lot of these boys who get really fixated uh-huh. and they love sports and they love sports so much, or they love comedy and they do it every weekend. But I think from a more realistic 
vantage point. I was in university. I worked at Hooters. I had a very busy Love. life that way. <laughs> and I would just do stand up. You said Hooters, then. right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that in a bit. Keep going. Right. <laughs> for the wings. It was for the wings. <laughs> it was for the money. <laughs> yeah. um, it's actually a beautiful matriarchy. It's a great place to hang mm. out with like-minded women all day and mm. <laughs> hardly any men. Actually, it was, um, you know, women helping other women, but, um, I didn't do stand up religiously. I wasn't there every weekend. I would do a few amateur nights on a Wednesday and that took mm-hmm. a few years. I never believed that it would be my career. I just did it as an outlet, as a hobby, the same that you would go to a zoom class or a zoom. We just say zoom, zoom class, class. Yeah. A Zumba <laughs> class. <laughs> like a pottery class. I just did it with no aspirations of having a career. And then that just happened kind of by accident. Did you know, like you say that, you know, and, and I started in like acting at 15 years old and it was the only thing I wanted to do. And I think that in that way, I might've suffocated it. You know, Mm. I think that I've, I've had a total breakdown last night. And I said to my husband, like, what if I never get to where I thought I would like, have I failed my whole life? Like, has Mm -hmm. it just been, have I given up so much of my life? Like I left my family in Australia to come here to be successful. And if you don't get to that success level, have you failed? And maybe the way you did it is the way that works because you aren't throttling something and you're not suffocating something. Mm. And there's much more of a flow out than there is uh, an obsessive need to succeed. And maybe that was one of the reasons why you did so well, because it was just something that you were enjoying every step of the way. Well, I think there's a lot more control with stand-up comedy than there Mm. is with acting. And I think Mm -hmm. you see a lot of women Mm -hmm. in LA who don't want to be stand-up comedians at all. They want to be actresses, Mm -hmm. but they have keenly figured out that if they can get five minutes on stage and if they can be writers, Mm -hmm. then they have a a better chance. I, I feel so badly for actors sometimes because so many occasions you are just at the mercy of mm-hmm. fate mm-hmm. you know you could be the best person and it's just not right for the role and having had to um sit in and uh, what's the word uh Audit. judge auditions audit yeah. Audit. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that's a terrible terrible position to be in because genuinely everyone is talented and it's just about choosing which voice is authentic for that one character but when you do stand mm-hmm. up you're not trying to do that you're just speaking your own authentic truth and then either people gravitate toward it or they don't or you can adjust or you can always Mm -hmm. do it put on your own gig I think Mm -hmm. I could pivot a lot more ways and to Mm -hmm. me success is just for me it was always autonomy Mm -hmm. and also I think whatever your goals are there are a lot of girls that I grew up with I'm sure you're the same in Australia Mm. Their definition of success was to get married after high school and have a family and live Mm. close to their parents. And I don't, uh, I don't think that's any less Mm -hmm. of a success story than mine is because Mm -hmm. those are the parameters within which they wanted to achieve, you know, Mm -hmm. their goals. And it's about finding happiness too, right? I mean, that maybe that's what keeps them, makes them happy, you know? It's like, once you reach where you want to go in that sense. Um, but it seems like for you, like your goals were always like kind of higher. You know, you, you've, di- you've done the stand up thing and you now you're doing the Duchess, which is an amazing show also. Um, so what does that look like for you? Like, it, are we going to see more stand up out of you or do you want to go more the acting route now? I wouldn't even call the act, the Duchess acting. Like I was uh-huh. playing yeah. a um, exaggerated version of myself, which is what yeah. I do on stage anyway. And I was trying to communicate my worldview mm-hmm. in a unique sense, the same way that I do on stage anyway. I think it was just a different medium for me to advocate for and tell the story of mm-hmm. a different shape of a family. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I am doing another tour in September. I have a new show. I think I'll always do stand up. I really believe mm-hmm. that that's the bones of what I do. And then if I get other opportunities, like I do um, uh, sort of immersive journalism sometimes over here, mm-hmm. or sometimes I do panel shows over here is a big thing in the UK. Mm-hmm. And if I get opportunities, as long as it's comedy, you know, like you'll never see me on the crown for various right. reasons. I'm <laughs> going to have like lip filler and breast implants on the crown. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I just love to be challenged in all the different comedy things, but it'll always be comedy. And to be truthful, I mean, mm-hmm. I don't think sitcoms are anywhere near as fun as touring and mm-hmm. people tell you what to do when you're writing a sitcom. You have to collaborate with people when you're writing a sitcom and you have to trust other people when you're doing mm-hmm. a sitcom. Mm-hmm. And I don't work well with others. I love to be in control, mm-hmm. left alone, Mm-hmm. The only person with a mind control, control. Control. Yeah, <laughs> right. We've heard that one <laughs> before here. It's hard to that yeah. control word is such a I feel like all the negativity in our lives comes from that obsession with control because really we can only control things to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. Um but your career, like you said, you know, my hubby and I a couple of years ago started our own production company because mm-hmm. we decided that you know, it's taken me a long time to say this, but if we believe we're talented enough Mm -hmm. and then, so what can you do, right? Instead of just whining about the fact that you're not getting this, this, and this, you're not cast on this, this, and this, what can you do? What Mm -hmm. can you control? And control is, you know, creating something from nothing for yourself and Mm -hmm. then trying to get that made. But it's a hard, you know, we did a show, Aussie Girl, we got, we, got it made by Sony and now we're waiting to see if we'll get picked up by Netflix. And I look at what you've done and the fact that you are on Netflix and Mm -hmm. do you realize how lucky Mm. you are to have been able to get a show on Netflix when, I mean, that's everyone's pipe dream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. I think it was an amazing opportunity and I'm really grateful that I was able to tell that story. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, even when nice things happen for me, it's the same feeling as when nice things don't happen for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I totally understand that a lot of it is just based on luck. And mm-hmm. if you... And you talent. Know, and yeah, luck. right, right. Well, you have to have the preparation. Ta- well, that's not, actually, that's yeah. not true. There are some, there's a lot of people I'm like, why are they on TV? <laughs> um, but most of the time it's luck and timing and talent, I think. Yeah, and, and I, I watch a yeah. lot of shows that mm. I love that are canceled or that are never greenlit past a pilot. And mm. I see a lot of shows that I think are shit that are mm. in their sixth season. So, I mean, mm-hmm. we don't all have the same taste. And my mother always said, if we all like the same thing, we'd all be married to your father. <laughs> and that was the liberating thing mm-hmm. to hear. I thought, yeah. And if they say no this time to Aussie Girl, they'll say yes next time or a time. But it does feel, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm definitely grateful. Mm-hmm. So w- you just brought up your family. I'm curious, what do they think of your your stand up? Are they sort of? I know you're very close to your sister, um, so I can imagine she would be very supportive, or your parents as well, like supportive of the comedy and and you know where you've gone with it. Yeah, they're fine now. Yeah, because I have a <laughs> five bedroom house with a cinema. In London. Yeah, because there's <laughs> success going on. Right, right. <laughs> now my mom has always been very supportive to the point that my the late show was my favorite show when I was a little girl. I loved uh-huh. David Letterman. I still do. I was not, um, you know, super politically engaged. I didn't really know what was going on with the interns, mm-hmm. but I, I was a big fan. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, uh, my mother would always say you could do that. He, the monologue was my favorite part. My mom would mm. always say you could be a comedian. And it's not that I didn't believe her. I just thought, mm-hmm. why would I want to do that? It's not something that I ever considered mm-hmm. but comedy was always valued in my house. You Mm -hmm. were uh, paid attention to if you were funny. And I really liked when the grownups respected me. I could feel that they respected me when they thought I was funny. I think it's a Mm -hmm. real show of mental dexterity and intelligence. Mm -hmm. If you can sit at the table with a bunch of drunk Irish adults (laughs) and hold court, I loved Mm -hmm. that feeling. So yeah, my mom especially has always been really supportive. Mm. When you, um, when I DM'd you that beautiful night that I'd seen your show (laughs) and you had said to me that, um, you'll probably unfollow me now that I've told you my stalker um, ways. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. You wouldn't unfollow me. She's like blocked. (laughs) Foxy, she's not going to unfollow me. She's going to mute me, which means like, I don't know that she's really unfollowed me in her mind. Because it still looks like she follows me. Um, but you said that your other comedy special, Glitter Room on Netflix, was mm-hmm. received differently because it made men very angry. Mm. Um, and the only bad reviews that I've ever read about any of your stuff when I did a deep dive 
AKA stalkership (laughs) um, was from men. You know, it was like, Mm. she's not funny. She's uh, overrated. And it was, it was always men. It's like, they don't know what to do with her. You know what I mean? They're like, what, where do we put her? Taking complete ownership of herself. Mm -hmm. They don't like it. Keep them, keep them quiet. Right. Mm -hmm. So why do you think that they react like this? Mm -hmm. I'm always interested I think comedy is a conversation and I'm interested in the reaction sometimes because I think it's almost more fascinating to be poorly received than it is to be well received. And I Mm -hmm. love watching the dynamics between the different demographics that really like what I do and the ones who feel so confused and angry Mm -hmm. and not just that they don't like it, but it's the way that they express themselves. They're so indignant they're like what is this why is this happening or they will say Mm -hmm. um she's trying to offend me she's trying Mm. and um i've just decided that i think some men and i have to be careful about this because in comedy i think it's always funniest to take an extreme position Mm -hmm. in comedy i don't think it's funny to say well some men in this way i just think it's funnier to say Mm -hmm. Men are like dolphins. They should be enjoyed on holiday. You know, don't have, I just think it's funnier. So anyway, some men are so used to being accommodated for. You see in relationships since the beginning of time that women are small or they stay small. They shrink themselves. They're quiet and they accommodate (laughs) space for this usually man in the relationship that takes it up historically. I mean, our mothers, our grandmothers, probably it would have been a very, um, different type of provocative relationship were that not the dynamic Mm. so some men are so used to being accommodated for that i think we're in a place now where the absence of accommodation feels like provocation Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i'm not trying to provoke any uh men i don't think about them at all uh glitter room especially was specifically written for the time in my life that i was realizing how empowering it was to be happy alone and to be a single mother and rejecting the stigma that I'd always felt was attached to being a single mother. Mm -hmm. I wrote that show for that purpose, for those women, for all the single mothers who are meant to feel ashamed or for single women who go home at the holidays and people say, why haven't you found a man? All these people, that's who I wrote that show for. I wasn't Mm -hmm. thinking about men. I wasn't thinking about offending men or not offending men Mm -hmm. because I wasn't addressing them directly or accommodating them then they feel provoked. And I think that's really interesting. It is really interesting. And and you brought up, you know, single parenthood and, and also just single people in general. And I feel like, especially single, I'll, you know, just go ahead and say single moms, like they don't get a fair shake. You know, like a single dad, people look at, they're like, oh my God, he's doing so much. You know, he's doing work and dad he's being this great park. dad. Yeah, dad changed a diaper, you know, and it's like all, you know, hell breaks loose. But like with single women, it's like, oh God, what happened to her? What did she right. do something? something to, you know, fuck up her life, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is. Why do you think that that is? And why do you think that that stigma is still there? I mean, I think that as much as there are wonderful single dads who do a great job and who don't fit that generalization, Mm -hmm. we know statistically that there are more single mothers than single Mm -hmm. fathers. You can say that's for whatever reason that maybe a judge prefers them, whatever that Mm -hmm. is. Biologically, we are connected to our children in a different way. We can't run off as easily. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. biologically, I think we don't want to as often. And you see that and you can't escape that reality. So um, I just think it's another way to marginalize and shame us and to say, Mm -hmm. oh, you know, she's damaged goods because obviously someone left you still in my life in this country. I'm very well known. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very like, I don't know, successful. And still a decade after I left my daughter's mm-hmm. father, people will take pity on me and they'll look at me and say, why did he leave you? Mm-hmm. I'm like, because I asked him to several (laughs) times. Like I begged him to leave me Um, and he was hard to shake. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) they just can't fathom Mm -hmm. a dynamic where 
one would choose that for some mm-hmm. reason. And I don't really know why that is, but it's just, they just don't believe it. They think we're discarded in some way and mm-hmm. that we don't have options. And that's the stigma that I really want to change. I think it's fine. Mm-hmm. If you, if your marriage or whatever breaks down and you have to co-parent, that's fine. And you can be friends and I'm very good friends with my friend's ex and it's fine. But this idea that we're damaged goods and that we've been discarded mm-hmm. is right crazy. Because of that narrative though, I always felt ashamed in my own relationship because I've, I've always worked a lot. And so my husband has had to pick up the slack for our two children. A lot of the time, my husband, the diapers, Mm -hmm. my husband has absolutely made three quarters of the meals. Plus he works as well, but because my job was much more like I had to be on set 12 to 16 hours a day. And so I couldn't always be there. Mm -hmm. I felt ashamed as a mother because I, the narrative of men, you know, mm-hmm. not like the women supposed to do that. And if mm-hmm. you're not doing that, then you've failed some way as a mother and you're a shit mom. Mm-hmm. So that's also a narrative that I think um, needs to change. Like there are men that do a lot, you know, and the woman doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be the person that you always go to for everything. Um, the idea marginalizes men as well. Because uh, absolutely. One of them who want mm-hmm. to be more, hands-on or stay home with their mm-hmm. children. My husband stays home and people are shocked by that. They're mm-hmm. like, what? He, there's judgment with any, of course. Um, mm-hmm. anytime you, I can't even, I'm like so tired tonight. I'm running out of words. Anytime. <laughs> I'm running out of words every day. I'm like, is it the mercury and the fish? I'm I like, know, I can something. <laughs> it's not like, or is it like, do I have a brain tumor? I literally just, I was trying to think of Nicole Kidman's name for 25 minutes yesterday. I was like, what is her name? I was like, the test. Her. yes, if you can't think of Nicole, I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Please keep no, going. Just anytime you deviate from Mm. the norm, there's going to be pushback. And I think that's Mm -hmm. why it's important for some of us to deviate very loudly. Mm -hmm. And also with a comedy edge too, which makes it more, you know, it's entertaining. People respond to it. But it's interesting. I learned Mm -hmm. with Glitter Room, you know, I've always been a feminist. There are people who don't understand what that means. Mm -hmm. It's just about equality, but of course, people are are dumb. Mm -hmm. I've realized that even with Glitter Room, which was released um, 2019, I think maybe early 2000, yeah, 2019, mm. even with glitter room, that was too much feminism for people. And they liked it more universally when I was a little secret feminist Trojan horsing it in mm-hmm. kind of giggling a little bit. And I thought, Oh, isn't that interesting? They, they don't want you to put all your cards on the table. So clearly you can trick them. Mm-hmm. If you want, they like that better. (laughs) Which is why I was going to say this one thing about like, it's a subject that I think is important to talk about. And it does speak to feminism because I always walk around naked in my house. (laughs) My husband's (laughs) always like, literally, he's like, you do know you have showed your entire body to the neighbors. I'm like, well, lucky for them. I mean, like, I don't care. It's just, it's a boob is a boob is a boob. Like, I really don't care. So your comedy is obviously irreverent. It's also sexually irreverent. And Mm -hmm. I'm from Australia where sex is just, and nudity is just not a thing. It just isn't a thing. I mean, Mm -hmm. people have sex. And, you know, my husband said to me the other day, he's like, well, what happens when my kids have sex? And I'm like, well, hopefully they're protected and hopefully they know what they want and hopefully they're enjoying themselves. He's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, sex is a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And he's like, I just can't even talk about it. I um. I feel like sex is still such a taboo subject. Mm -hmm. I feel like you talk about it a lot. Um, How do people accept you when you talk about it? Is it more taboo Mm. in the States, you think? Or is the UK much more open? Mm. I think it's interesting you say that about Australia. I think the UK is more open, possibly, because, I mean, we just have different styles, I guess, different genres. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't get to do a lot of stand-up in America, but I have... Uh, from time to time when I'm in LA, gone on in the improv or the comedy store. And that's mm-hmm. rare for me, but it is shocking. Just the small shift in tone. Mm-hmm. I find that American standups, and, and this is not a criticism in any way. It's just what the audiences want and what the, the zeitgeist is at the time, I guess. American standups, in my experience, talk a lot more about drugs and race. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then here, we would discuss maybe 
structures of prejudice, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we would never be like, so this Indian guy walks in and you know, this, this is a black guy who says this, and this is what the different, this is how white guys drive is, you know, I'm paraphrasing, right. but uh, we don't have that at all. And we do people like when you talk about sex, because I think it unifies mm -hmm. people. Um, something we all hopefully do yeah right i was gonna say most everybody hopefully is doing it one and way or another good, and it's a good yeah. thing like at the end it's like a positive thing mm -hmm. <laughs> well even the government released some advice during covid saying that the, the government this is the queen's <laughs> british government <laughs> said that you should if you're going to be uh, dating people that uh, you don't know very well then you should avoid having sex face to face <gasps> Oh, the queen is telling us to have sex. I knew she was a little risque, but um, yeah, she's a wild one. That one, but that's pretty progressive. That's pretty progressive. Like, like the government of the <laughs> United Kingdom of Great Britain, just being like, get it from behind, yeah. wear a mask, <laughs> doggy style preferred method, preferred uh, uh, what do you call it? Position. Yes. yes. <laughs> see, okay. Is it Nicole Kidman? Nicole Kidman. See, yeah. got it. I'm like, uh, Her name's yeah, Nicole Kidman. Her name's Nicole Kidman. <laughs> so yeah. So, so I mean, this has been probably the hardest time of I think all of our lives mm. um, during this pandemic. How ha you know? How have you been during this? Has your mental health suffered, or is that even something that you need to check in on? Mm -hmm. um, like Roxy, I do every day. <laughs> are you okay? Are you depressed? Are you anxious? Like, how are you going? Yeah. Or is that something that you're just much more of an accepting person of? You know, this is what it is. As it is. I don't love it. Mm. Of course, but I understand that I'm in a much more privileged position than most. So mm -hmm. therefore I can't complain. I think that a lot of people reject privilege. They feel defensive and they say, no, no, I'm not privileged because actually I had to work on a farm and I'm not privileged because, you know, I have allergies, but, um, I, <laughs> I, I find <laughs> that <laughs> taking a moment to just recognize the, the privilege that you do have and feel grateful, mm -hmm. it, it is good for your mental health in a way because it checks you. You go, okay, well, Catherine, you have nothing to complain about. Mm -hmm. So it's good to get that perspective sometimes, but also I kind of live anxiety free. It's really weird because wow. hanging around with creatives, mm -hmm. a lot of my friends are like neurodynamic and they talk mm -hmm. about having anxiety. And I just like truly don't give a shit about anything. Mm -hmm. I'm always exactly like this. Just <laughs> does so, that lead to more depression, or is that not? You know, I'm not saying you. I don't know, that came across wrong. Like you look depressed. That's not what I'm saying. But because just being even sometimes does that mean like you take on the weight of the world um, when it isn't? You know, I don't know. I just don't think I'm smart enough to get hyped up about anything. Like, <laughs> I, I'm very happy. I have a lot of dogs. Uh -huh. um, that helps. That helps. Yeah, the dogs. I, just, I don't know what it is. I just think. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just happy all the time and I haven't enjoyed this. And I have mm -hmm. had some like financial insecurity, like, Ooh, what's going to happen? Ooh, can we tour anymore? What's I've thought about those things. And then I worry mm -hmm. about the greater impact of all this. And of course I have opinions about how it's being dealt with. And, mm -hmm. and my husband is a little bit of a conspiracy theorist these days. So then I listen to his takes as well. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't love it by any means, but I don't have depression or anxiety. I have salt and vinegar chips. <laughs> <laughs> which is always a go-to, which is always yeah. a go-to. How has like parenting been during this time for you? Because I know for Tam and I, like we talk about this, you know, we've been in homeschool since March and it's, you know, it's been a bit of a struggle. I mean, I know for me, I don't feel like I'm a teacher, you know, like in that way, you know, <laughs> daily doing That's all the things. Sure. Right, right. The patience that is required and just, you know, the care and, and, and all of it. But how has that been for you? Because we're all sort of struggling with our kids a little bit, I would imagine. Yeah. You know, no, I think it's fully offensive for parents to uh, try to teach. I feel like, how <laughs> dare you? That's okay. someone's entire career. Like someone yeah. went to university <laughs> and they <laughs> take a low paying, thankless job right. just to teach your children things they don't want to know. Mm. I'm not even going to try to do that. So I took a very hands-off approach to homeschooling. <laughs> my daughter, <laughs> Love it. Yeah. My daughter's older though. She's 11. Mm. So I do feel so 
badly for people who have one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three. I mean, that is a ridiculous age to be told you can't go to the park and you can't see your friends. I think the effects of that will be Mm. discovered at some point for some kids. You're not supposed Mm -hmm. to just see one face. All the I time. said to my husband that, you know, and I'm saying I said to my husband a lot in this conversation because he's the only person I see. <laughs> um, I, I said also today, I was like, we can't fight because we only have each other. There's no <laughs> other choice. <laughs> so stop being a dick. I'll stop being a dick. But I said to him the other day, I said, you know, I worry that I might be doing irreparable damage to my relationship with my daughter, which I've never actually spoken about on a podcast before because mm-hmm. my, I, you know, over here in the States, it's really crazy. Um, you know, there's a lot that's locked down. There's a lot mm-hmm. of fear because a lot of people are getting sick and they're dying and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And what happens is I'm at the top of my limbic system. My limbic system has raised and has gotten to my top. And then she becomes the brunt of my frustration. So that when mm. she says she doesn't understand what 10 plus five is, I'm like, Oh, it's so easy. Every other kid knows what you're, they're doing, mm-hmm. which at some point is going to affect her. And she's at some point going to be the therapist saying like, my mother doesn't believe, <laughs> didn't, didn't believe in me. You know, you're supposed to be doing words of encouragement. It's just mm-hmm. like, I worry that the relationships we have with our kids and our daughters and our sons, mm-hmm. you know, are going to be affected in some way. And that's what scares me and makes me the saddest about all of this because mm-hmm. you can't keep your shit. I mean, maybe you can, Catherine, because you seem to always have your shit together. Yeah. I can't always keep my shit under wraps. I can't. You just, you're, you're, you're a living, breathing, non-robotic human being. Yeah. Well, I do think it's really nice for kids to see you unravel actually, mm-hmm. because they, their nervous system is still developing. And I think if everything is utopian in your mm-hmm. life and you don't see things go badly, one day something's going to go really badly for your daughter and you don't want it to be the first time Mm -hmm. you want her to get in a argument at school or get Mm -hmm. dumped by someone and have her heart broken. And then you want her to know, Oh no, you know what? I remember in childhood, a lot of times my mom (laughs) would lose it. And then, or a lot Mm -hmm. of times my mom would cry in bed all day and be really sad. Or a lot of times there'd be arguments and then five hours 12 hours later, everything was okay again. And I think it's good for them to see the pattern of having a quarrel or being hurt or being sad and then recovering. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think that's all right. And I think it's okay to be human with your children. They are experiencing some level of understanding and stress about this pandemic too. Mm-hmm. So I mean, COVID or no COVID, we're all doing irreparable damage to our daughters. Make no mistake yeah. about that. More so that's fine. That. That's Don't yeah. Too it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> but you're also you're also a kind of a newlywed too, you know, yeah. at this point. And your love story is like so amazing. I mean, you knew him 20 years ago in high school, high school sweethearts. Um, or you were you were dating in high school too, correct? Yeah. I started yeah. dating Bobby when we were 15. Okay. Okay. And so then you guys went your separate ways, but then you came back together again. Like, how did that happen? So we have an ancestry show on the BBC called Who Do You Think You Are? Yeah. And it's amazing because a geneticist and a historian Mm -hmm. who are just so world renowned, they're so good at what they do. They dig through your past and they can find 10 generations of your family. And there's an actor in this country called Danny Dyer. Mm -hmm. And he's a real um, lad, like a real cockney. Uh, I don't want to call him a troublemaker. He's a wonderful guy, but he's like, you know, about like this, and he's like, fuck you up, hey, and what? Like, he, uses this, <laughs> he uses the C word a lot, but always in the right way. Uh, um, <laughs> and he's related to royalty. Like, one of his ancestors is King George or something. He is 128th in line to the throne, and they found uh-huh. us out on Who Do You Think You Are? It's just so cool. Such a cool yeah. show. So I was hoping I would have some Danny Dyer story, but without any involvement in colonialism or slavery. (laughs) Right. Um, And then I was back in Canada searching my ancestry, which turned out to be just a lot of like preachers and fishermen. (laughs) But Bobby walked into this bar and he really was, I have to say, and all my ex-boyfriends can tell you this, you know, when you speak about your past and ex-partners and stuff, I kind of hated everyone, but I would always be like, oh, I really did love Bobby though. My first boyfriend, Bobby, I really mm. loved Bobby. I truly did. And then we were 15 and I just believed, oh, maybe I really loved him because I was 15 and I, nothing right. terrible had happened to me yet. 
Mm-hmm. But he walked into this bar and I was like, whoa. And of course I was drinking because my sister was there. And I had to film <laughs> at seven in the morning, but I got it in my head that it would be hilarious to sleep with him. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So I brought him back to my mother's house and my mother was out of town. <laughs> And he thought it would be a hilarious idea to sleep with me as well because we still have mutual friends. You know, why mm-hmm. wouldn't you? You get one. And you hadn't slept right. together, obviously. Yeah. You, this is the first time you would have slept together. I ha- Well, I moved to a different country and he was yeah. married for a while. Like we didn't speak at mm. all now for really 20 years. Wow. And um, then I realized my mom's brother in law <laughs> was actually home the entire time, just being traumatized <laughs> with, by the sound. You know, I didn't know anyone else was home. <laughs> but he is cool. He never grasped me out. He never told anyone what he saw or heard that night. That's a lot of pressure mm. for him. Not having sex was <laughs> oh, that, that long. And then to be like, hey, we're going to have sex for him. Was the expectations really high? And like, you know, I... I don't know. I probably no. have to cut this out. I'm probably going to have to cut this out because my husband would be like, you can't say this, but... Like the first time I had sex with my husband, I was like, done. Like, we're, I'm going to marry this guy because fucking, oh. like, I'm, why would I go? Like, why would I go anywhere else? Like, um, I found it. I'm good. He seems really nice. No, he doesn't. He's a nice guy. He's funny. He's smart, whatever. But if you don't have that sexual chemistry, like, yeah. I, I don't think I could marry someone if I didn't have a sexual chemistry. Like, people do. Mm-hmm. But, like, and I'm talking, like, a, like explosions, you know? <clears throat> yeah, so, they shouldn't. They shouldn't. Yeah. Right. So, when you first had sex with him after 20 years, it must have been something pretty incredible. Yeah. Because, or, or, or maybe not. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> well, the first time we had sex, we were 16. So That's why I, mean, I said, how- okay, okay. So, you did. So, you had it Revisit. first. Revisit. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. Was that the first time I ever had sex with him? No, I was a little okay. slag. I had sex with him when I was 16. <laughs> <laughs> you had to test drive the car. Was it different? Right. What's the point of not, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, now he'd had sex more than once. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was great. He, <sighs> oh, so you said something about your husband that he won't like. I'll say something about my husband he won't like. Okay. He dated, um... You know, people are very modern now. So some of the women that he had dated mm. uh, ha- also had slept with women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm really vanilla and I was in a relationship for a really long time. So I've never, had never sex- slept with a woman. I've never slept with a woman. Mm. I've never had sex with a man who's had sex with a man. I'm very boring that way. But some women that he dated had had sex with women. Mm-hmm. And I think those are great women <laughs> for everyone's husband to be sleeping with because they teach them a lot, apparently. Mm. <laughs> I, I love these women. I'm like, what you need to do is have sex with more lesbians. Well, I mean, <laughs> yes, he's great. No, it was like amazing. And he was so sweet too. And I didn't want yeah. to fall in love with him. And he's mm-hmm. texting me right after not playing any games, mm. just being really lovely. And this was right after I had done Glitter Room. It's before it ever came out on Netflix. It was this anthem to being alone. And I really, truly did want to be alone. I was looking forward to becoming an eccentric elderly woman with even more little dogs and (laughs) doing everything I wanted to do and being uncompromising. And then I just married him six months later, genuinely, because I couldn't think of a reason why not to. Yeah. Did you try not to? You tried not to. Yeah. But you tried to reason with it and say like, no. That's that's why your life is the way it is because you're, Mm -hmm. you're not throttling everything it's able to free flow out of you that's why yeah. you're getting the guy and that's why you're getting the you know, show the and like yeah. that's why you're getting yeah. the life it's because you're not suffocating it and that is such mm. a lesson on letting things flow which is so hard to do too yeah yeah, yeah. i mean you're letting go of control was What's your that? sex was your first sex roxy um what was that like? <laughs> oh, my first sex. You have to say one thing David doesn't like because we both have. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. So sex the first time with it. So I met him on like a work trip in Miami. Mm-hmm. So fully went there actually thinking I got. So I was with a girlfriend. We got separate hotel rooms, but we did have that chemistry there. And of course, I did test drive the car on the first night because that first I night fully, I first fully believe. Night. Yes, I fully believe what is the point of wasting time if you're not going to yeah. know you know i'm like if 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 everything's good and the test yeah. drive works i'm in but like why am i gonna wait and see yeah. like down the road you know like oh god this sucks sucks you know the passion right. isn't there like 
why do that? So I didn't waste any time. I just went straight for it and we got engaged seven months yeah. later. Uh-huh. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it just like for me, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of that. I'm like, go for it. Check it out. Like, don't feel bad about it either. But sexual chemistry is such an interesting thing because mm-hmm. I dated many guys who I disliked so much. Mm hmm. But what was I the could sex not. Good? The what sex was, was wonderful. See, that's and the I thing. and I even remember breaking up with one guy, and I was like, "Get out of my house! I like can't stand you." Then I was like, "Can we just do it one more time? <laughs> <laughs> just one for the road. Just one more time. One for the road." Um, but sexual chemistry is an interesting thing. Good for you. I love that you did that. You're like, you're finished. However, <laughs> however, <laughs> one last time. And, he didn't, and he, uh, he, yeah, he didn't say no. So yeah. How important is sexual chemistry to you, Catherine, like in your previous relationships? Was that like... I never had any in my previous relationships. Genuinely, I I liked probably one boyfriend after Bobby. Uh And then I was very... uh, I I don't think I was stimulated Mm -hmm. intellectually in my Mm -hmm. small town. And the Mm -hmm. first person that I met who wasn't from my small town, everything he said was so fascinating to me and interesting to me. Mm-hmm. And I, he was older than I was. And I was mm-hmm. like, Ooh, this is an interesting person. And then I would like them. I would mm-hmm. sexually start to be interested because I liked them. It, it was mm-hmm. always intellectual. For right. me first. Yeah. And, the, and mm-hmm. I was always making mistakes because I wasn't, you know, I was using this little tiny intellectual brain that's so new instead Mm. of leading with this intuition that is thousands of years old. You know, Mm -hmm. I wasn't using that muscle. Mm -hmm. And then I would end up with these absolute scoundrels and vagrants. Mm -hmm. And then I dated a guy for a while just to punish myself because I felt badly for leaving my daughter's father. And he was a Mm -hmm. real uh, like vampire of a person. Mm. And then I never really, he was very sexual person, but I wasn't attracted to him. I was so Mm. weird. I just did what I thought I had to do to be in the right relationship. I led with, um, these, these bad navigation systems. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I was so happy to be alone. Cause I was like, ah, I had, you know, these shackles of, anchors of men I had finally gotten rid of. And Mm -hmm. I don't blame anyone but myself. Like uh, who found them? I Mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. And the only time I found the right person is when I wasn't looking. And I do have Mm -hmm. definitely the best sexual chemistry with him. And it's because I wasn't looking to make a connection with anyone. I was trying to do something funny that my friends would enjoy. (laughs) (laughs) Is it better now, like the connection with him now than it was back then? I mean, we've just always, he feels like family to me. It's really weird. I've known Mm -hmm. him since I was a child. So Mm -hmm. yeah, we have a lovely connection now and we've been through, you know, an actual, uh, like system of ups and downs and Mm -hmm. been together now in a pandemic for a year. So it's accelerated Mm -hmm. our relationship a lot. So we're not really like newlyweds at all. Mm -hmm. It's like, Oh, you again, like we're so close, but I've always felt close to him just instinctively. It's really weird. And I know his family, you know, he's not like a new person to me, Mm -hmm. but now I have to hear about the conspiracy theories. So (laughs) Oh, I know there's a (laughs) trade-off. Yeah. My husband's always like, he he said to me the other day, he goes, I think all the TikTok stars are robots. They're not really TikTok stars. And he's like, if you look at them closer, he's like the way that they, like one of them, she does like all these facial expressions and he's like, Mm. she's not real. They've like got all these people to follow this, like as an experiment. Mm -hmm. And then I said, I tried to, I tried to get him on it the other day. I said, ha, you're wrong because she just did a TikTok with one of the other TikTok famous people. And he goes, they're not real either. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck is life? I'm like, where are we? Who are we around? Like, what planet? Because he's like, he, and then, and then it's like, well, he goes, and then he goes, question everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. And I think he's absolutely right. It doesn't take long to sell me on this theory because mm. their children with these perfect midriffs. Mm, and yeah. there's certainly a robotic formula to exactly mm-hmm. what they do. Mm-hmm. And like an ex- it's a social experiment. Well, they're, they're all absolutely. doing the same song and dance. They're all doing the mm-hmm. same thing, you know? That could be a Imagine deep if they weren't real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You wait until I communicate this downstairs to the <laughs> <laughs> Command central downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you but, know what? You hear mm-hmm. them try to do anything else. You hear them try to do a podcast or do a meet and greet. Mm-hmm. I don't they're think they ever have. Ones. 
Yes, they do. I mean, some some of them, no, some of them haven't ever because that's why. <laughs> no, because I don't think they're real now. <laughs> well, you, you watch the ones who do and they're not real. I have been privy to many a meet and greet and they can barely string a sentence together, a lot of them. So you tell your husband, he's a delicate genius. <laughs> yeah. I'm on board with what he's done. And I want to see his YouTube videos. Yeah. Long presentations about this theory. It's weird that the way that they... <sighs> You know, these kids who I think the, I think the problem is probably the instant gratification and the instant fame, yeah. um, because when I was 15, I worked my ass off like I was on a show at like home and away. Mm-hmm. You know, the show over there. Yeah. 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 I was on the show for like seven years or something oh. um, when I was 15 and uh, I like worked really hard. You know, mm-hmm. I was on yeah. set. 16 hours a day and you know my weekends were you know doing stuff for the show and you know that work ethic was instilled in me from such a young age and Hmm. things didn't happen overnight and then after the show you lose everything that's what Aussie girl's about it's about a girl who's just trying to you know succeed in some way and she just keeps failing you know and it's that Mm -hmm. universal story that we all know of like trying to be someone and then but these kids they don't ever get the down the 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 downfall of it it's always just keeps Mm -hmm. going up they will and and unless you get the unless you get you know the motions of both of the waves then um then you never really you know you never become humble you gotta fail you gotta trip Mm -hmm. and they're all under threat it's a very weird environment because mm-hmm. they are existing in this cancel culture that is alive and well on TikTok. And mm-hmm. it's all about exposing so-and-so said this and so-and-so mm-hmm. exposed mm-hmm. so-and-so. And it's the people with the, the phones out filming, you know, someone getting mm-hmm. yelled at for not wearing a mask in a shop. Like that is all that TikTok is, is trying to be exposed and expose and it, it's like it's all so intangible it's quite mm-hmm. scary thank god it wasn't around when we were coming up in that way thank you know god. we would have right? been a mess roxy oh, oh shit you think I this mean... is bad <laughs> <laughs> Just like... yeah yeah i'm like oh thank god you know that would that would have been a fucking disaster disaster did you, like, do, uh, okay. um, did you have like a little handheld vhs camera of your parents and make home movies and yes stuff? yeah oh no but it wasn't the little one it was like back in the day when they were like this big <laughs> you know? VH, VH, like s <laughs> like the tapes i used to get kylie minogue oh my god yeah. <laughs> look at my dad like and i can't even remember the song now but like i'd listen to it in my my ears and like you know we drove up Six, six hours to like move house this one time and I just remember like listening to it on repeat and there was something like it's that texture of those things mm-hmm. that I yeah. think is sad and the smell and the feel like what it made you feel that mm-hmm. you will never get back like my husband yesterday went to a record store for an hour just to look at records oh <laughs> he didn't even buy them <laughs> he was like I had the best time like you're so weird um but, but yeah, even like, like the the mixtape, remember? Like yeah. you would put two recorders next to each other, play one and record on the other. You know, like this is like what the kids these days don't even understand. It's like if they don't have it at like the swipe of a, oh, yeah. you know, push of a button or like a swipe, then they're and like. Someone, one, someone wrote on my, um or, or like a story, who's in sync? And I was like, oh. <laughs> excuse me? <laughs> excuse me? <laughs> That's I scary. <laughs> I know, like Katy Perry brought Missy Elliott out at the Super Bowl or something, uh-huh. and all these kids were like, "She's so great to introduce this new artist." Missy Elliott. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I, I had a friend uh, who works in like magazine publishing in New York, and she was saying that one one of the youngs, like the little interns coming up, I guess Dave Grohl came up in conversation, and they're like, "Oh yeah, that old guy from the Foo Fighters." And then and then my friend corrected the girl, and she was like, "Well, she was." And I mean, he was in Nirvana before that. And they were yeah. like, Nirvana? Yeah. Hadn't even heard of Kurt Cobain. Like, none of it. I'm like, uh, the isn't kids nostalgia the- such yeah. a, a terrible feeling? <sighs> I know people go, oh, it's not terrible. But it's like this sick longing. Like, when you go past your old house, when you, it only happens when you get to a certain age, though. Like, you don't have it, and then you get to a certain age. Maybe it's, like, your early 30s or something. And you yeah. go past, and you see your, mm-hmm. <clears throat> you're at home when you were, like, seven or eight. And it's just, like, I don't know. It's this, like, weird feeling. Mm-hmm. It's it this weird, weird long. Yeah, it's a weird. I think it's lovely. And we had 
so much freedom to make mistakes. And that's mm-hmm. what I think these kids, they're very risk averse now. And they always feel like, oh, I can't make a mistake because everyone will know. And mm-hmm. and they're right. And we didn't have that. And it was actually so liberating. And that's oh, what so makes me nice. sad for them. I, I had those little cassettes and I would make my own radio shows. God knows what I said on there. It was like a yeah. Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Those are like under my bed at home at my mother's. It's not published. See, but you have that. And it's, it's so fucked up because our kids will not have that. They won't have that like, you know, option to step back and be. I mean, we can try to give that to them as much as we can. But like, yeah, the way the world is working and the way it's going, there's they're not going to have what we had and be not. able to kind of be themselves and grow on their own and not be influenced by all these other, you know, things. But that being said, I watched Lennox Hill, which is um, that show on Netflix about uh, the, the hospital in New York City that does mm-hmm. a lot of like brain tumors oh, yeah. and cancer. Mm-hmm. And I thought I wouldn't be able to watch it. And it was just magnificent. I just thought, you know, now I understand the human brain so much better. And it just, it's just a thing. Like it's something that they get, you know, it, it became less scary when you unveil mm-hmm. a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And I just realized that yes, our children won't have the mixtapes, but what they will have, which we didn't have when it comes to things like disease. I mean, they are taking away tumors that they 20 years ago would never yeah. have been able to touch through, through, like threads they they Mm -hmm. put threads into your brain and suck it out through a tube that they would never have been able to do and they'll get to a point where they might not even have to like go into your brain and do it you know Mm. so you always get something to give something it just but you'll be dead anyway from eating bats and rats thanks (laughs) 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 one way or another we We have to do quickly um never have i ever and then you can go and like be a person again and like i don't know i'm being a person right happy just be happy i know we didn't someone someone sent me a tracksuit like custom it's so amazing i wish i could (gasps) show you it's like what they would wear on the golden girls i know this is a podcast but like (gasps) it's no we film it (laughs) Oh, okay. <laughs> She's like, oh, we've got okay. you on film, girl. <laughs> it's so like the tracksuit of my like sixty-five-year-old dreams, but oh, now I love it. it. I'm living my Dude, life. Dressing I'm like a golden sister. girl is like the ultimate. Dressing like a golden girl is literally the ultimate. Oh my it's God, the goal aesthetic. Yeah. Okay. Never have I ever. So this game is super easy. You just Ooh. have to say. Um, we say never have I ever like eaten the head of a bat. And you like you like I have or <laughs> I have it. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so never have I ever. Oh, this Wait, is good. Wait, if one. you're watching, sorry, if you're watching oh, this, yes, um, yes, Roxy. Okay, if you're so if you're watching um, our YouTube viewers, please go to iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts to, to listen to the Never Have I Ever with Miss Catherine Ryan because you do not want to miss it. Oh, all right, yeah. all right, all right. Okay, well, we should let you go because, like, again, you have uh, other things to do. Okay, Catherine, tell us all about so the uh, the best place to find you social media right now. Yeah, okay. well, I had a website, but my friend is divorcing the person who hosted. The radio. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Don't yeah. you hate when that happens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right now, it like defaults to this Australian freight shipping company, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> I mean, I don't care. I have Instagram and Twitter uh-huh. and TikTok, actually. <gasps> and it's all half and Netflix, guys, watch her special. Yes. I'm serious. Amazing. Yeah, you... And the Duchess as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, the algorithms of Netflix are funny. It's like, it might not show it to you unless you look for it. So I have mm-hmm. my sitcom's called The Duchess and Duchess is spelled with no T. The greatest shock of my life is that no one can fucking spell Duchess. <laughs> not even in the UK. They like associate it with Holland and spell it all wrong. Douches, I've seen. Duchess. <laughs> Duchess. And um Duchess. <laughs> yeah. And I have two specials on there and I'll be touring again soon, you know. Yeah. Whatever. I well, feel hopefully like hopefully we can be in the audience. As yes. Well. well, I come to America sometimes if I'm allowed to travel. But I feel badly that, you know, you've billed me as a comedian on this podcast and we just talked about quite sincere things. Well, you told us the minute we started that um you're like, this is who I am. I'm just sincere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she is who she is, you know? Don't worry. I've laughed. I've laughed. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you can find us on Women on Top Official on Instagram. And Women on Top Podcast on Facebook. And I am Tam Sursak. And I am Roxy Manning. And we are Women, Women on... on. Ah! It's
Yeah.